Well, Manjeka, my name is Nick, and I am broadcasting today from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I would like to pay my respects to elders past and present, and any young people that are watching today. I'd also like to recognise that we benefit from the knowledge and insights of First Nations people here in Australia and um, around the world, including their long relationship with the plants and fungi that we revere. Sovereignty was never ceded. Thank you for joining us for this special EGA webcast on the lead up to our December 5th all day EGA webcast. Do find out about it at the website entheogenesis.org. Uh, it is a special event that we're going to be putting on in place and in lieu of the physical Garden States event that we had planned for December, but with all of the ups and downs, trials and tribulations of this year, uh, we have postponed that until 2022 when we can guarantee to get everybody together for a proper EGA in-person event. The Garden States all-day uh, workshop, all-day forum is going to be a fantastic event though, so please do uh, register for that one at the website, again, entheogenesis.org. We're going to be hearing from people like Juliana Furchi, uh, Mark Ross, Bruce Pascoe, well, who you're going to be hearing from shortly, actually. That's a, a special treat for you for right now. Uh, Anya Ur Urmakova, uh, Sam uh, Gandhi, uh, Liam Engel, Rick Doblin, Martin Williams, Stephen Bright, Monica Barrett, and many more. Find out more at the website. I'm going to repeat it again, entheogenesis.org. Again, it's an all-day event. Uh, it's a, uh, a fundraiser that's going to help us uh, raise funds for projects like these webcasts, but also like some of the resources that you can find on the EGA website. Do go and have a look at those. It's an ever-growing collection of resources that we are developing for the community for you. Now today we have this special webcast with Bruce Pascoe. This was recorded on a Tuesday a little bit ago uh, and it was recorded um, with a, a special attendance group of EGA members. So if you are interested in becoming an EGA member, again, website, find out more information and get in contact with us. Subscribe to the newsletter. That's the best way to keep up to date with what we're doing and get in contact with us to find out more. Uh, so as I said, this was pre-recorded on a Tuesday. We had a Q&A session as well. That Q&A session uh what all the all of the questions came from our members and you'll be hearing that now so i'd like to introduce bruce bruce pasco uh has published widely in both adult and young adult literature he has won numerous awards including the children's book council of australia eve Pownell uh, Pownell award for young dark emu New South Wales Premier's Book of the Year Award in 2016 for Dark Emu and the Prime Minister's Literature Award for Young Adult Fiction for Fog a Dox in 2013. In 2018, Bruce uh, was awarded the Australia Council uh, Award for Lifetime Achievement in Literature and he's worked as a teacher, farmer, fisherman, barman, fencing contractor, lecturer, Aboriginal language researcher, archaeologist, site worker and editor. Bruce is a Yuan, Bunurong and Tasmanian man and currently lives on his farm in Gippsland, Victoria and I'd like to welcome Bruce now uh, to the EGA web screen. Bruce. Uh, thank you very much and um, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with uh, all, all your colleagues and I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri um, and their care for their land over millennia and um, the, the great work they're doing currently in, um, in caring for their land and telling the story of their land uh, to non-Aboriginal Australians because um, it's really important that we uh, enlist the, the assistance of non-Aboriginal people um, to recognise uh, Aboriginal sovereignty, but also Aboriginal land and uh, what, um, how that land has been nurtured and cared for and maintained over such a long time. And that is going to be a benefit for all Australians, in fact, the whole world. Um, but we need real knowledge about it. So we need, uh, we need good science. We need, um, um, we need good practice. And um, so that's what we're doing on the farm. We're trying to 
um, engage young Aboriginal people in um, learning about their culture and making their living from it, uh, making their living from um, looking after country and um, uh, growing food. Um, it's been a really important week. I don't know whether you saw the front page of The Australian last week, um, where it talked about what the Mythica people um, and Josh Gorringe and Michael Westerway had been doing. Um, I've been following this excavation in their country for the last four years, I think, and it was eventually got through all the protocols that uh, universities and scholarship requires, and a report came out in Antiquity magazine, uh, but also in The Australian, as I mentioned, and it was on the front page of The Australian. Um, and um, for me, that was really gratifying that such acknowledgement to that site could be given. And what uh, Michael found was that these strange structures that they were examining uh, turned out to be quarries. And, of course, when you have a quarry and intensive labour, um, you have to have accommodation for the people doing the labour. So the, there are villages in association with those quarries, as you would expect. The quarries are massive. There are a number of them. And they were used, apparently, to... Um, mine blanks of grinding stones. And these grinding stones were traded um, along what um, Michael Westerway compares to the Great Silk Road, a cultural and economic exchange of knowledge. This is a, a mighty thing for Australians to know about their country and their history. And... The importance of it is that these stones were used to grind grain into flour and it makes it one of the earliest occasions on earth when that was done, uh, but also on a scale that is almost impossible to comprehend um, given the Australian history that we've been taught in our schools. This required an enormous amount of skill but also an enormous amount of labour, not just the quarrying, but the production um, of grain into flour. And um, skeletal examinations of some of the, uh, the remains that were found on that site indicate hard labour and, um, you know, quarrying and grinding are hard labour but our people were dedicated to getting provision of food, not just for today, but for tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. And so that was an incredibly important site because those people were living on a vast grassland. And similarly to the grasslands that occur down here, because um, we have a few remnant sites of um, Aboriginal grasslands here, and there are very few trees on them. The best soil in the district and very few trees. Um, on my wall here, I have a map of the Malakuta district, which was given to me by an Aboriginal man from Bensdale, and it was found as a draw liner in the Department of Lands. And this map has every river, every hill, every bay, every beach, every island named in Aboriginal language. Um, it's incredibly important that uh, these points are named in Aboriginal language because it declares sovereignty of the land. Now, in my hometown of Malakuta, it's a town I love and the people that I love because I've known this mob since 1969, um, and there's a, a myth going around in this town, and it still goes around, 
that there were no Aboriginal people here. So when I got that map, it was proof that uh, Aboriginal people had been here, had named every point, and um, Europeans acknowledged that because this map was made by the surveyor of the day, McCabe, uh, 1846, so very, very early on in European presence in this district. And it's very remote country here, so Europeans got here fairly late. Um, but the, the other importance of that map is it also indicates vegetation zones. And those vegetation zones are sometimes appear um, under McCabe's words as herbs. So once again, really good land, top quality soil, um, good uh, watering of that land available from streams, and yet there are no big trees. The best land, good water, and no big trees because Aboriginal people had been growing crops. Those herbs, uh, we suspect, uh, are probably things like myrnong, vanilla lily, uh, bulbine lily, uh, all the plants that um, Aboriginal people had domesticated. And I know there are, um, you know, when I say domesticated, that, you know, uh, Facebook trolls are going to get terribly excited and, um, you know, melt their fingers down on the keyboard. But domestication occurs when you uh, consistently harvest a crop over a long period of time. And that's what was happening here. So there was human agency here. And um, during the long thousands of years of interaction with those plants, that's how domestication occurs. So the plants that we're using on the farm here are Aboriginal plants and were chosen uh, for domestication um, because of their nu nutrition values. Um, kangaroo grass, for instance, one of the ones that we use here, very difficult plant to thresh and quite difficult to mill. And yet Aboriginal people chose that above other grasses purely and simply for its nutritional values, and uh, which they must have observed over thousands of years. Um, and um, I'm going to talk um, about those plants in more detail later, but... Uh, the other piece of science that turned up on my inbox this morning was about the domestication of cassowaries. There's a very recent report um, released today which indicates that people in Queensland were domesticating cassowaries and the age of that interaction makes it the first time when domestic fowl were... Uh, used by humans for eggs and meat. This is an incredible discovery, and it's um, alongside the, um, the bunion nut harvest and it's alongside the black bean harvest in that district and further south that Aboriginal people were engaged in interaction with these plants for a very long period of time. And because that provision of food um, allowed them to spend more time in the houses they built there. Um, not completely sedentary because, you know, Europeans aren't completely sedentary either uh, because as soon as lockdown is over, people will be going to their beach house or um, hiring a cottage on the, down at Twofold Bay or something like that. We're not completely sedentary. Aboriginal people are not completely sedentary either, either then or now. Um, we travel our country today. We did then, we travel it today because we have a responsibility for the land to see how she is, uh, to care for her, to see if there's anything she wants or needs uh, because she does provide for us and our responsibility is to her not her to us. And this is probably 
the single most important difference between European culture and Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture, where our people uh, saw themselves in service to Mother Earth rather than Mother Earth in service to us. So that um, study of cassowaries I see as being very important. There are so many of them. There's another study that I've been following for three years now which will indicate that people were creating gardens to grow plants and all they were doing was creating a 2% difference in moisture retention in those gardens, 2%. But that 2% in that district was sufficient uh, to go from having no plants to some plants to increasing the availability of root vegetables uh, to a district which was highly devoted to art and culture. So those people in that incredible artistic project needed food. And so Aboriginal people went about making provision for that food by building these incredible gardens. We'll learn more about that in the coming months and years. Um, I hope we don't have to wait four years for that uh, uh, scientific study to become available to us. But it is exciting for me that when I first went to school, I was told that Aboriginal people had been in Australia for a couple of thousand years. Um, by the time I got to upper primary, it was 5,000 years by the time I was in secondary, it was 10, then 20, then 40. Cow Swamp in Victoria um, up those dates incredibly. By the time I got to university, 45,000 years was considered um, uh, accepted. And, um, and then um, I started looking at the Brewarana fish traps, I, amongst other features around the country when, while I was writing uh, not just Dark Emmy but also Convincing Ground because I was following uh, the massacre sites um, of Aboriginal people and the massacre sites very commonly um, are on the same land as the harvest sites. The two go together, unfortunately. But um, at Brawarna, um this incredible site, which some say may be the oldest human structure on Earth, of course that's debatable, but a scientist has posited that as a theory and it deserves our investigation, not our refutation. We don't need to throw up our hands and, um, you know, go for the kill. What we need to do is think about it as Australians because this is our country, and whatever the history has occurred since 100,000 years ago, 120,000 years ago, according to the archaeologist Jim Bowler, that's our history too, as all Australians. Um, and I can speak, um, I can use the, the pronoun our, because, um, as I've always said, I'm more Cornish than Curry. Um, so I value it as a Cornishman, but I also uh, value it as a Ewan man because I'm, um, I'm Ewan, born on Tasmanian, but I'm living on Ewan land. I'm actually on the southernmost boundary of Ewan land. So I value this information, uh, not just for uh, Aboriginal culture, but for all Australian cultures. This is our history. And um, we can learn from this history. Uh, we wouldn't be having this um, drawn-out kindergarten debate about climate change if we had accepted our history in the first place, if we had accepted the sovereignty of Aboriginal people and if we had accepted the economy and agricultural economy that um, the old people were undertaking. We would learn a lot more about our country we would be treating her better, and maybe uh, we wouldn't be 
um, in the same state we are in today. Of course, we depend on the cooperation of other countries around the world, but um, maybe this is a good argument for uh, valuing the knowledge and patience and care and love for Mother Earth of all Indigenous peoples. Um, I have a lot more to say about Aboriginal culture and uh, how socially it was structured and how philosophically profound it is, but uh, we're talking about plants today, so I'll better get on with it. Um, basically, what we're growing on the farm here are perennial plants, and perennial plants sequester carbon, and uh, because we don't use the plough, we try to replicate the old people's harvesting systems, which was to uh, lift the plant uh, when it's tubers um, and select some of the tubers and press the plant back into the ground. Now, Europeans actually witnessed Aboriginal people doing this. And, and when our lands were taken over by Europeans, Aboriginal people were sometimes cheeky enough to go into the, uh, the white person's backyard and lift their potato plants and um, put the top back into the ground because they knew it would grow. Now, um, at the time, Europeans were saying, how sneaky were these Aboriginal people? You know, fancy um, pretending that they hadn't stolen anything. Well, I think... Actually, what was going on was Aboriginal people knew that they could take some potatoes and leave some for the, the new owner of that soil. Um, so when we look at things um, in terms of ethnography, um, we have to keep an open mind. And uh, sometimes ethnographers are so convinced of the superiority of their own race and methods that uh, to think about and acknowledge the knowledge and methodology of uh, the Indigenous race is uh, uh, not fully developed. So the perennials are a really important part of this whole matrix of land care. But it's supported not just by the economy, not just by filling your belly and having some for tomorrow, but it's supported philosophically. Uh, the people in the centre of Australia uh, call themselves plant people, grass people, um, and the term panara means grass, and many of those uh, peoples use it as a, uh, a suffix uh, for their own name. And um, I know that it, around the back of Sydney, Darug people are doing that too because Darug means yam or myrnal. So they call themselves after the plant. You know, you don't need to um, gather too much more evidence to understand the importance of these things uh, for the old people and, the, and our people today. The whole point of the farm is not just a botanical experiment. It's about employing Aboriginal people in tradition, traditional methodology. We might use new methods. You know, we do have two tractors on this farm, uh, but it's about making sure that Aboriginal people are part of this industry because I don't want to see a time when a judge says to human people or any of our people, like he said, to the Yorta Yorta, um, I'm sorry I can't give you your land rights because your culture has been washed away by the tide of history. And uh, the whole purpose of the farm, like I said, is not just botanical, it's political and spiritual. And that's why a lot of our work is attended with uh, philosophic and spiritual ceremony because that's how the old people did it. And that's how we have been instructed to do it, uh, by descendants of those old people, because you and culture, the culture of the people who work on this farm is unbroken. It was almost broken 
but because one boy survived the massacre on the Broadrid River, we now have our law. Without that boy, uh, we would be retrieving law. But because of that boy, we have accepted the law uh, in a direct line of descendants from that lad. And we're very lucky and we're very fortunate to um, be able to say that and enjoy the benefits of that law. We've also got a, a duty to the forest. Australian forestry is... Um, in, um, in flux at the moment, I think, because um, the 2019-2020 fires that consumed the east coast of Australia, and um, I'll say that slowly, consumed the east coast of Australia. This is an incredible fire. And yet, we, after the fire, we, we were just blaming the trees instead of blaming our method. And the fire here... Uh, was generated uh, by plantation timber. These plantations have trees that grow like celery, cheek by jowl, and it, it is so flammable that when I, um, I, I got my daughter and the grandchildren off the farm and um, coming back through the fire, I passed... A, a plantation which no longer existed. It was white ash, snow white ash, half a metre deep on the forest floor. There wasn't a tree standing and it had been totally consumed by fire because that um, method of growing trees had been so uh, dangerous that it had obliterated the forest. Um, the old Aboriginal method of uh, forestry and food production went hand in hand with the forest, not either or. The, the plants that we're growing now uh, were grown within the forest as well as on the plain. After the fires, we noticed grasses coming up within the forest that we had never seen. We had to search through books to find out what they were. Since um, the recovery of the forest um, on this farm and elsewhere, those grasses have disappeared because there's not sufficient sunlight um, and too much nutrition drain going on because of regrowth. Uh, tobacco bush, wattle, um, small eucalypts, these have outcompeted the grasses. But we saw for an instant there this incredible symbiosis between forest and plant. It wasn't always like that, but we know that if we thin our forest and leave 10 or 12 larger trees for the acre, we are close to replicating the old East Gippsland Aboriginal forest. And we know this from European observation, that you could ride a horse in a straight line between Bensdale and Sale, um, around colonial times because those massive trees had their first branch so high off the ground that you could ride a horse beneath them. And, uh, and the importance of that is that they were virtually fireproof. There was no ladder fuel and we are attempting to replicate that. What we're doing, and those lads are up there on that hill now uh, doing that, um, it's going to take 70 years. I'm not going to see it. I, we, when, when we were talking with those lads the other day, we were saying, you're not going to see it either. Uh, so what you're doing today, you're doing for your grandchildren. And what we all need to do as Australians, as world citizens, is we need to work the land for our grandchildren, not ourselves. Not to get a quick buck out of wood pulp, not to get a quick buck out of industrial agriculture, but to ensure that the land will yield for our great-grandchildren. The, the, that forestry program that we're working on up there um, is in its infancy, and we learn something every day, 
every day that we work on that land, we learn something about it. So we are uh, rediscovering uh, what the old people knew. And it's an incredible learning curve and it's going to take 70, 100 years at least to do this. But our uh, country deserves it, I think. And we'll all, be, we'll all benefit from it. You know, this is not about going backwards. Um, this is about going forwards, about learning about the earth, about learning how to provide food for ourselves without destroying the earth. Um, we're growing kangaroo grass here. Uh, this hillside in front of me um, is um, almost... Uh, covered in kangaroo grass, uh, microlinus diploides, orchids, um, a small forbs, and most of them were eaten by Aboriginal people. It's a system. It's a botanical system. And a lot of people come along and said, well, how can you get more kangaroo grass here and get rid of these other things? You know, how can you harvest these and uh, with these orchids on the ground? Well, what we have to do is have a more complex harvest. We have to be smarter about the harvest and about what machinery we use and how heavy that machinery is. And we have to have more people on the ground. We have to have more farmers, not less. This is a labour-intensive industry. And we always, in forestry and agriculture, we always blame greenies for the reduction in the workforce. It's terrible to listen to, um, you know, mill owners in this country talking about how bad the greenies are because they've robbed uh, these little towns of jobs, you know, that uh, these towns no longer have football teams and netball teams because its population is too small. But they used to have those things, not because there weren't greenies around, but because more people worked in the forest more people worked in the, on the land. And that's created community, created society, created economic wealth, a different kind of economic wealth, uh, supported, supported by large labour force. Um, but we need, to, we need to accept the fact that if we want to change, then we might have to employ people, not machines. One forestry operation down here a little while ago, uh, because of the archaic, but, you know, oh, I can't tell you how crude this operation is, but because of the contract that had been signed, um, if it rained, the contractor was able to leave the flatland <clears throat> where he was harvesting trees and go up into the high country um, and harvest trees, and we witnessed this operation. The, the wheels on these harvesting machines were as high as the, the ceiling, and every turn of their tyres in that wet country, even though it was up, up high because it had been a wet season, um, every turn was like an excavator, and it brought the gravel to the surface, completely destroyed the soil quality in that forest. Um, so the forest there now is completely stunted, what there is left of it. And because it was still raining, all the topsoil raced into the river and ended up down on the flatlands. The only time we ever got action there was because a farmer complained, because that forestry operation had dumped gravel on his grass. So it wasn't it wasn't science that was getting the attention. It was a farmer, a good-hearted farmer, I must say. Like he actually helped me during the fires and vice versa. But, you know, it was done for the wrong reason. It was done because this is a National Party seat. Now, we've, you know, we've actually got a National Party representative here now who understands a lot of this stuff, so things have changed um, marginally. But... We need to look at our forestry operation better. Um, so I'll, I'll spend a bit more time talking about the plants rather than the forest. I'd, I'd love to talk 
about the intricacies of forest management and how badly we've managed it so far and why we send all our wood pulp to Japan and then buy it back as hamburger wrappers. I'd love to talk to you about that, but I don't have time. Um, we're growing some tubers here and we're learning about them every day. Bulbine lily, um, chocolate lily, vanilla lily, um, and, you know, a, a few others um, that we're only just uh, learning about now. Um, and, you know, we've enclosed our gardens so the magpies and crows and the live birds aren't uh, kicking our stuff all over the joint. Um, so we've got a, an environment where we can work and, and get a reasonable amount of production out of it so that we can then plant out in the open where the crows and the magpies and the live birds can have a, a fair crack at it. But we need to build up a bit of stock, so we're growing those in gardens. But we've also got on this property, which was the cheapest farm in uh, Gippsland when I bought it, um, it's also got a lot of swampland on it, which is why it was cheap. But from that swampland, we're harvesting water ribbons and kumbungi. I think kumbungi is going to be an enormous crop in Australia. Um, that, you know, they're digging it out of water channels all over the country uh, because it slows down the irrigation. But what if we uh, looked at irrigation differently and saying, well, there's water there, and instead of pulling out the plants that want to grow in it, um, why don't we leave those plants and use them commercially? Aboriginal people harvested kumbangi in enormous quantities, and that's from European observation. Diary entries of people like Kirby and Beveridge in particular, um, <clears throat> they had seen Aboriginal people stacking this um, kumbangi uh, as high as a house, and it was gently steaming. Now, whether fire had been introduced to the bottom of that heap or whether it was just the decomposition of the vegetation that was causing the heat and the steam, we don't know. But whatever it was, it was heating the plant to such a point that its um, starch was dropping out. We suspect that it was a form of starch production and fibre production. So the starch was useful in making bread and the fibre was useful in making just about everything else, baskets, nets. Uh, the whole deal. Um, we've also got water ribbon growing here, and we've only just begun um, taking that water ribbon from one dam to the other. Um, and it, our examination of that is really in its infancy, but it's so exciting to do. Um, it does mean you've got to get in the water with the brown snakes, but um, we all get along. Um, and there's another really interesting plant that we've put a bit of time in, um, and I'm conscious that there's got to be some time for questions, but this is Kunjim Winyu. Um, we try and use our own names for these things as much as we can, uh, not just to be secretive, but so that we can retain some intellectual property, um, some engagement in these things, because... What I noticed after Dark Indian was there was enormous enthusiasm from chefs and bakers and restaurateurs um, about our foods, but no idea about how to include Aboriginal people in the benefits. That continues to this very day. Of all the money made out of Aboriginal foods, so-called bush tucker, a term I refuse to use because it's a diminutive, um, and it also talks about it also re infers that there was no organisation, that it was just a collection, uh, not a provision. Anyway, um, all, of, all of the money made out of those foods, 1% of it goes to Aboriginal people. That's a disgraceful statistic. Uh, the departments of agriculture, um, governments at, at every level, state, federal, local, I should be ashamed. 
that uh, people overseas read that those figures. One percent of all money made out of Aboriginal food goes to Aboriginal people. That's what we're trying to do here on the farm. Um, I've uh, one of my um, partners is uh, at a meeting with another local Aboriginal group right now, um, talking about what they're doing in their country, and. Um, so it's not just happening on the farm, it's happening everywhere. You know, uh, Kakadu plum people, uh, uh, Mitchell grass people, um, you know, uh, oyster and mussel people, you know, there are people all around the country re-engaging with their plants and employing Aboriginal people. We're just, um, we're just part of that system. We are also part of a system where all of those people are trying to come together in order that we change that 1% uh, to Aboriginal people into, let's say, 30% minimum, you know, maybe 50% in 10 years, maybe 60% in 20 years, whatever it is. We know that non-Aboriginal people are going to grow these things as well. They've got them growing on their farms anyway, anyway and just haven't realised the value. Although several farmers have told me since they're growing perennial grains, they make less money than they've ever made before, but a greater profit. In fact, one bloke said he's, you know, the family farm has never made a profit for 35 years. Um, the first profit they had was in their first year of harvesting perennial grains. Didn't make as much money, but made a profit. That's not a bad statistic for the country to know. So Kunjim Winyu, this little plant that I was started to talk about and then distracted myself with other things, it um, grows in salt water. It can also grow in fresh water. Obviously, it likes water, but it can tolerate salt. Any plant that you can eat that tolerates salt is going to be of amazing value in Australia today. Um, and so we, we approach this plant with reverence. Uh, carbon emission reduction targets easily and uh, we will create jobs in the process. As that farmer I referred to before said, every year since he's been growing perennial grains, he's downsized his tractor because he doesn't have to haul a plough. All he's, harvest, all he's hauling around is a tiny little harvester, light as, um, because he never needs to plough that land again. Uh, he never used it never uses another chemical. I think one of the top um, line items in any farmer's budget these days is chemicals. For some of them, it is their major expense. Stop using chemicals, stop using artificial fertiliser, you're bound to start making money. Uh, we just have to think about our earth differently. Anyway, I'll give you my chance now. I could talk about this all day, and I'd love uh, one day to... Um, get this mob off the hill over here and for them to tell their story, what they've found out, because they come up with a discovery every day. It's wonderful. Thank you, Bruce. It's been wonderful hearing those stories and our uh, commenters in the uh, YouTube chat have been uh, enjoying the tales as well. Uh, so we're going to go to a few uh, questions and thank you everybody again for joining us on this special uh, webcast uh, on, a, on a Tuesday morning. Um, I know it's a bit of an awkward time, but we are recording this for our December event. So we uh, have had to postpone the in-person event, unfortunately, again, as these things uh, happen. That's just the nature of things at the moment. We have to be ready for um, whatever the state government throws at us. Uh, and at the moment, December is not a good time uh, for having an in-person event, so we will be holding a special uh, version of uh, EGA's Microdose webcast, um, and we'll have more details about that soon, uh, but you will be able to watch that there, uh, entheogenesis.org. I'm sure everyone here in the uh, comments section uh, knows where to find that information. Okay, so Bruce, We've uh, got some uh, questions coming through now, uh, and I'll make that scroll in a second, but I'll just ask you this one now. How can non-Aboriginal people pay respect to Aboriginal people while gardening? Um, well, look, I think knowing the history of the country is incredibly important. Um, accepting that history um, 
It's not something we have to go to war about. We don't need a history war. We just need a, a history discussion. And like I said about all this new material coming out, embrace it. It's about your country. And it's not about trying to turn uh, Australia into a communist country. Who, who would want that? The communists uh, drained the Aral Sea. You know, they are no better than capitalists in caring for country. So it's not about politics, really. It's about care of country. And the Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people have been here for 120,000 years. Even if you don't believe that, even if you think Jim Bowler, one of the best archaeologists in the country, is talking through the back of his neck, let's say 65,000 years, because we've accepted the fact that the oldest grinding dish on earth was found in uh, Arnhem Land uh, near Kakadu, and it's 65,000 years. Uh, let's say 65,000 years. That is longer by 40,000 years, perhaps, 50,000 years maybe, from any other civilization on Earth. If you can't learn something uh, from people like that, with that amount of knowledge and experience, I don't think you've tried. And we can, we can learn something together, but black and white. We can learn it together, but I think we, in order to do that, we have to accept the history of the country. Instead of fighting over it, let's learn and let's respect each other. I'll just add to it, though, that, um, you know, when, um, when these products come online from Aboriginal people, um, you, could, you could buy our product instead of the black and gold variety that is you know, almost destined to arrive. Um, I've, I've lost the sound there, but I'm reading the ribbon. Um, and I would say that um, the way that we address the conflict between First Nations people, ecologists and the broader community is with love and respect. Uh, let's throw knowledge in there as well. But let's have a really good conversation about it because if we continue the way we're going and destroy uh, the globe, then... Uh, we're showing that we despise our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. And I don't think there's a need to despise those little babies unborn. Um, we need to make sure uh, that the world is, is theirs, that they will still catch a fish in the river, that they will still walk through the forest, uh, that they will still have a, a garden behind their house where they can grow food where the air quality is good enough, the water quality is good enough, and the soil is still fertile. Um, we owe that uh, to people, because to, to do otherwise would show our, um, the fact that we despise our great-grandchildren. Apologies for my audio there before. Can you hear me all right now, Bruce? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Good. <laughs> so you missed a bit. I was uh, saying before that my, I got a nice little uh, care package from my work uh, just uh, because of the lockdowns, uh, and all of the uh, all of the products in it were um, were not just locally owned and made, but also from Aboriginal businesses, and they were all food products, um, really tasty food products. There was a tomato sauce, some taka, um, some chocolate, um, and some other bits and pieces. So yeah, that was a really nice um, nice thing, and there's some some good businesses out. There that now I know I can go and support. Um, so yeah, sorry about the uh, audio problem there, but keep those uh, uh, questions and comments coming uh, in the YouTube chat. Um, and our next question here is: Could you tell us uh, more about your dancing grass bread? Uh, um, we call the dancing grass Mamajan Naluk, um, and it's um, um, it's a blend of grains. Um, because of that harvest procedure that I was talking about before, uh, we've got a multitude of grains growing. When we harvest mamaj and nullip, we're also harvesting spear grass um, and some kangaroo grass um, and some wallaby grass. So it's a blend. Um, the funny thing is that the, the grasses that uh, mature together tend to be compatible in flavour. 
Um, I don't know whether we're imagining that, but uh, when you when you bake with our flour, and I, I'd love to have tons of it, but in fact, um, we've, we've got kilos of it. Um, it'd be wonderful to have tons. But when we're working our way toward that. Um, we thanks to a non-Aboriginal farmer um, up uh, the back of uh, Roxham near here, Yambala, um, we're able to harvest broad acres of, the, of these grasses. And uh, we trialled it last summer and we'll be into it big time this summer. Um, but this blend, when you cook with it, it's so aromatic. Um, the smell in the kitchen is incredible. We lost the wonderful baker John Reed last week. Um, now John Reed had Red Beard Bakery. He was John came down to our first harvest. Um, he slaved over um, grain separation, um, but it was a really rugged few days because we were learning from scratch. But then we got into the kitchen, had a couple of beers. They were very nice. Um, and, and started cooking, and everyone just said, what's that smell? And that was our flour. You know, chefs, um, people in their own kitchens are going to love this. Um, now, the yields per acre may not be as great, but then again, there's no ploughing to be done, there's no chemicals to be spread, so you can tolerate um, low yields if your costs are even low, and uh, that's what we're looking for. So, yeah, Mamaja Nalak um, is a great grain, and we it became after the fires it became a um, a predominant grass on our grassland, uh, whereas before it had been hardly recognisable. Um, what we we did notice this year is with we weren't able to burn this year. There's all sorts of regulations which ensure we can't. So Mamaja Nalak is now a minority. <coughs> Pardon me, now a minority grass. Um, so what that's taught us is we have to burn every second year, um, at least on the grassland, to, um, to regenerate this type of grain. Uh, because we've got um, Buru Nalak as well, um, and Nara Naluk, uh, the, these are grasses that are the same, that they, they used to be burnt by Aboriginal people. That is part now of their plant's life. They have become used to burning at a particular time of year by Aboriginal people. So that's part of the domestication. And if we want those grasses, um, we're going to need to follow that regime which makes for a really interesting conversation between the CFA and the Shire and the farmer. But we can burn safely. Um, we, we burn, we're burning here now. And the, the rule is, um, for these young people who are working on these, if you can't walk through that fire, it's too hot. And remember that Aboriginal people walk through the fire barefoot. So if you can't walk through your fire barefoot, it's too hot. And that's what we try and do. Um, so that is truly a cool burn. And that's what we do. You know, we, we light the fire, we monitor it, we cross backwards and forwards through the fire, and it just trickles um, and never gets up into the, the canopy uh, because we're trying to thin that forest to put more separation between the trees. Um, it's a whole process, so it's a um, huge learning curve, great excitement for Australians, um, especially when, you know, people who can't get a job these days can get a job in the bush um, walking quietly around a fire. It's not actually real hard work. Um, you're just following the fire and you'll learn um, a lot about... Um, about your land, about your country, about your animals. Because, the you know, the kangaroo looks over its shoulder and sees the fire and goes, oh, geez, I've got 10 minutes of grazing here, and they go start feeding again. They're not scared at all. They, they know that they can just jump through the fire as well. 
Thank you. Um, are there any native Australian fungi that you foresee as being popular future, uh, future medicinal uh, or edible products? Unlimited opportunity for these things, but um, we've got to learn from uh, macadamia, kakadu plum, um, lemon myrtle, now being grown overseas by multinational companies and being sold to Australia. You know, there, there's unlimited products that can come out of this. We're using one here now from a plant that I've already mentioned, which is um, an insect repellent. Um, but the, the trick is not finding the product, um, finding the plant, growing the plant. The trick is making sure Aboriginal people are, are part of it. And that hasn't been done so far. But when it's done, it'll be a joyous uh, coming together of Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. It'll actually make Australia great again. And, oh, sorry, I keep having a mosquito buzzing in front of my face. Uh, keep those questions coming on the uh, YouTube comment section. And thank you again for joining us uh, for this uh, special broadcast. Uh, and to uh, Jonathan Carmichael for putting it together. And, of course, Bruce for uh, uh, being here with us on this Tuesday morning. Uh, our ne uh, next question um, comes, again, from the YouTube comment section. Uh, what should non-Aboriginal people ask themselves before engaging uh, with, and I know you just said you don't like this term, but the term uh, bush food? Foods and medicines. Uh, well, that's the question. How do Aboriginal people benefit from uh, the exploitation of these things? And the previous question was about fungi. And we're really conscious of fungi because um, we're, we're aware that the orchids on the property are benefiting from a fungi. We don't know which one it is, uh, but we know that we can't grow those orchids without the fungi. And there, I'm reading a book called Entangled Life at the moment um, about fungi, and um, it should be the farmer's Bible or one of their Bibles because obviously there's more than one holy book, um, and we should learn as much about those, that, that massive web underneath our soil uh, that is totally destroyed by um, superphosphate and uh, things like that. So the question to ask ourselves is how can we um, grow these plants and grow food from them? How can we include Aboriginal people in their production and benefits? And um, how can we look after our soil in perpetuity for these um, great-grandchildren who we refuse to despise? Yeah, very uh, important for people to be thinking about these sorts of things. Um, our next question, I think we've got a couple more questions for you, Bruce, so thank you for, uh, for sticking around for our uh, Q&A. Uh, when planning to collect botanical specimens from country, uh, what's the best way to approach this respectfully? Uh, how can people address colonial stamp collecting, uh, biopiracy and bureaucracy, which has been the status quo uh, for, I mean, much of all of the colonial era, it is what colonialism is? Mm. Well, look, um, the two truths of Australian history are Aboriginal people aren't going to go away, non-Aboriginal people aren't going to go away. Um, we all um, live here now, we're all Australians, and we ought to be able to live together. So that means we also are going to live together in the forest and um, we're going to um, rely on the plants in that forest. And if we're taking plants to uh, grow together, um, I, I don't see it as a bad thing. The example that we need to be uh, cautious of is um, the orchid diurus fragrantissima. Now, it was the dominant plant, not just the dominant orchid, it was the dominant plant in... Um, colonial Melbourne, people referred to it all the time as snow in the paddocks 
the white orchid was so prolific, it was like snow in the paddocks. It was an Aboriginal food source. And today it is, I think, restricted to 12 plants on an industrial site. And the first year those 12 plants uh, bloomed, somebody came along and harvested them all because the perfume is so great, the beauty of the plant is so great. So it was a terrible, um, terrible result for those the great environmentalists who were trying to protect that plant and, you know, potentially bring it back to its former glory. But the question I'm asking of that group is where are the Aboriginal people in your program? Because this is um, Aboriginal domesticate and um, we need to include Aboriginal people in that. And if you can't find a way to do it, then ask yourself why. Why do you find it impossible to include Aboriginal people in that recovery? Um, this plant was so prolific that people would go out and uh, lovers would have a tryst in the paddock and harvest armfuls of it to celebrate their love. That's how common it was. That's how aromatic, how beautiful. Now, to have a, a land where that grew, where it no longer grows, where lovers cannot harvest an aromatic plant to celebrate their love, is a real indictment of our farming practice, of our um, suburban development. We can do this again, I'm sure, um, but we need to protect our soils more because the soils that those orchids grew in, you could run your hands through the soil, run your hand, your fingers through the soil. It was that friable. You do that today on the same land, you'll break your fingers. You know, we need to bring the soil back to that tilt. And so you want to get rid of hard hoofed animals off those places. Not all places, you know, we're not going to go for you know, to, from cattle and sheep to kangaroo overnight. But we can start, and we need to bring back that teeth, that tilt, get rid of the, um, get rid of the um, hard-hoofed animals, get rid of the superphosphate, because that'll kill the orchid straight up, um, and um, get rid of heavy machinery on the land. Um, and, that's, and let's get back to the tilt of the soil that Isaac Beatty reported on it in the colonial period. And it was he who said you could run your fingers through the soil. And he was amazed. And he was amazed at the contours that Aboriginal people had built into the hillsides of Melbourne um, in order to harvest uh, myrnong and other plants like this. But Isaac Beatty must have also seen this white orchid. Um, not, not everybody reported on it, but... You know, the benefit of looking closely at our history is you do find those reports in the newspapers and uh, things like that. This, this plant was reported in the age last year. Uh, sorry, 2019, I think it was. Um, so look it up for yourselves. It's um, Diurus fragrantissima. Um, and its history says everything about Australian history. And... It shows us everything that we need to change. I'll um, try and look that one up uh, in just a tick and drop the uh, spelling in the uh, in the chat just for anybody who wants to have a look because um, uh, I, I, I feel like I've come to appreciate fragrant uh, plants uh, a lot more as I've as I've gotten older. Um, I've realised that it's a, a memory of the seasons passing, um, the smells that you smell in the air, um, and that's something that I took for granted when I was younger because I guess you just don't have the same uh, longevity of, uh, of of experience and and maybe the same. Uh, appreciation for uh, for that that sensory experience. Um, our next question, Bruce, is uh, what Aboriginal plant story could the ethnobotanical community learn from? Um, well, I think the, the, a, a lot of Aboriginal stories are about food and about plants uh, because eighty percent of our diet was plants. Um, so those. Those stories talk about sharing and they talk about punishing waste. Uh, waste of food was anathema. So someone can correct me, but 
is it 30% of all the food that we grow is wasted or is it 60%? I don't know. Whatever the percentage is, it's horrific that we would waste even 30% of the food we grow because of the system we have. Um, because that apple has a tiny blemish on it, so it doesn't even go to market. These systems we need to change. And I, I think in Aboriginal story, so many of the ones that I know are about sharing food and not wasting it. I think that's a great lesson. I think that's sound advice, very sound advice. Um, more questions. Thank you uh, to everybody who has been asking questions so far. Uh, Stephen Bright, uh, Darklight, uh, Rowan, Liam, um, thank you all in the comment section for uh, asking those questions. Uh, Bruce, what current project are you most excited about? Uh, I think, look, there are a number of them. I, this forest uh, thinning that we're working on, I'm very excited about it because I've got to be. Um, because I'm only going to see the very start of it, so I've got to watch it very closely to enjoy it. But I, I think Kunjim Winyu, this little uh, marsh plant, which we use as a salad vegetable, um, I can just see it being the basis of the Australian salad um, instead of the iceberg lettuce, which consumes an enormous amount of water, needs refrigeration, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, Kunjim Winyu is a very rugged little plant, but incredibly tasty. It's seasonal because it's, at the moment, um, it's now flowering and the flower, um, you know, affects the, you know, the appearance and the, uh, the taste of the vegetables. So this is probably the off-season for Kunjim Winyum and we would go to something else. We've got another little feathery little green down there which is absolutely delicious. We don't know what it is, um, but probably at this season, Aboriginal people transferred from Kunjim Winyu to this other one. So once again, seasonality of food um, is a lesson that we can learn about. You know, we can't have strawberries every month of the year because that's not how they grow locally. Local food, lo low food miles, they're, they're really important lessons that could be learned from Aboriginal people too. Yeah, that's certainly the case. Um, thank you. Uh, I think we've got time for a couple more questions. Um, if that's all right, Bruce, are you uh, right for a few more? Yeah. Thank you so much for this. Are there any organisations uh, that you would like to mention uh, and think that our community should know about that we should support? Oh, look, um, find out who's, which Aboriginal community is in your, your district. Um, find out the projects they're engaged in and whether they need help. Um, you know, whether they need help in labour, um, help financially, um, help by encouraging government to get out of the way. Um, all of those things uh, would be really useful. So you know, embrace the local Aboriginal community. Don't interfere. Don't, you know, a, a lot of non-Aboriginal people, unfortunately, and I hate to say this, but I've probably got to now, um, think that when they get engaged in the Aboriginal community, they're delivering charity that the, the white person has ridden in on the white horse with the lance and is there to save Aboriginal people. Don't need to save us. Um, but if we ask for help, give that help, but don't turn yourself into a missionary uh, because mission managers um, acted from a, such an assumption of superiority that the relationship was impossible. So, you know, be, treat Aboriginal people like humans, not children. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I do think that, yeah, I, I mean, when I look around me, I often see that sort of uh, uh, attitude from people. But I think, uh, I mean, I, I'm probably also biased because I'm around the sort of people that um, uh, are maybe more likely to 
think through these sorts of things or at least try to uh, engage in a way that's uh, uh, a little less patronising. Uh, what is your opinion on these types of Indigenous and contemporary cross-cultural contexts? Well, I think they, I think they can only benefit us um, uh, coming together um, as equals. Um, is going to be a good thing. And I think we'll learn a lot about each other. We'll learn a lot about our country. And, um, you know, acknowledging the uh, the sovereignty, the prior role of Aboriginal people in land management will be a big thing. So while we're equals, you know, um, it has to be acknowledged that Aboriginal people have got a, um, a prior occupation here prior knowledge, and that has to be respected. Yes, certainly. That's um, one of the things that I um, uh, try to include uh, whenever I do an acknowledgement of country um, and a reminder to people that a lot of the uh, the knowledge, uh, even when it has uh, when it is known, it's often obtained without respect or it's uh, it's stolen essentially um, from uh, from people that know and without uh, respect for cultural protocols. I often think um, that you know it ends up being that a Western perspective is seen as an objective perspective, um, and you know I, I think we might have some philosophers in the uh, in the comments section uh, who might like to speak about the nature of objectivity but there's uh, you know it's, it's certainly a, a much wider debate than uh, one perspective asserting itself as objective but that's that's part of the colonial um, it's part of an imperialist mission it's part of colonial mission um, that's that's what that's what that is. Uh, our next question from the comment section. Psychedelic plants have helped uh, this commenter connect with uh, their Indigenous family's culture in a spiritual sense. They grew up not knowing of their heritage, but since finding their mob and spending time on country, psychedelic plants have enabled them to communicate with their ancestors and re-energise some song lines and sacred sites. What are your views on this? Uh, well, I'm probably the most conservative man in Australia um, and I've seen so much damage done to our people by drugs and alcohol that throughout my life I've refused to have anything to do with them. I'm, I have friends who, um, you know, have used these things, um, but I tell you, um, because of the damage that is done in the spiritual life of the UN people on this coast that I know about, and at our last camp there was 75 people, uh, sometimes there are hundreds, um, alcohol and drugs are banned because the use of them in our current society has been so damaging for our people that the old people running those camps can't abide them. Now, we know about pitchery, you know, the, the, um, the quarries that I was talking about before are on that pitchery trail, that silk road. Pitchery was a really mild narcotic. Um, so, look, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not a really good person to talk to about these things because... Um, I'm following the lead of the old people um, who think that if we're going to recover our culture and repair the damage to our community, that um, one of the best ways to start is without these things, uh, simply because of the, the way they're used today. Often they're used without any kind of philosophy or spirituality. I respect the fact uh, that your experience is different I really do respect that, but it's not for me. Um, a reminder that people from Indigenous communities, Aboriginal people across Australia are more adversely affected uh, by drugs and alcohol and more incarcerated, uh, one of the most or the most incarcerated peoples in the world. Um, and a lot of this has to do with the policing um, and the, uh, uh, the, the, 
the the lack of a policy response around drugs and alcohol issues, um, and this is in every state. Uh, we, we hear about some of the issues maybe across the other side of the country, but it's it's right here as well. Uh, and it's because the response is poor, the resourcing is poor, and the understanding uh, is poor. Uh, and we need to improve that. I work in the alcohol and other drug sector, um, and it's it's not even resource enough to do. Um, any of the work that it should be doing because we, we focus uh, on spending our money on policing. We fo focus on spending our money on, on throwing people uh, in jail. So um, understanding and supporting uh, what uh, AOD workers and harm reduction workers are, are doing. And, uh, look, I'm preaching to the converted in this, uh, in this session, but um, uh, that's one way that we can, you know, help our Aboriginal brothers and sisters as well. Uh, Bruce, our next question. Can you recommend any websites, books or other resources for people, including those overseas who can't physically meet with local community uh, but want to learn about Aboriginal Australia? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at a few up here. There's a wonderful novel written by um, Tara June Winch, which won the um, Miles Franklin this year. Um, it's called The Yield, and I, I recommend it um, to anyone as a, a great way of understanding uh, the history of the country and Aboriginal people. Um, but... Uh, there's a young Aboriginal woman called Coleman who has just released a book about Australian history. Um, I think that is fabulous. Um, but I, I would also recommend the journals of Charles Sturt, uh, Sir Thomas Mitchell, uh, people like that, um, Lieutenant Gray, Rupert Gerritsen, a um, non-Aboriginal man, wrote a book called Australia and the Origins of Agriculture. For me... That's uh, one of the most important books in the country. I relied on it heavily. I acknowledged it heavily in Dark Emu. And I'm just sad that Rupert um, didn't get the accolades for that book that he deserved. And the reason for it was that no Australian publisher would touch it. And um, he had to get that published in England. And it is published in the most repulsive format you can imagine uh the you know it's a two color cover black and red um it's saddle stitched you know stapled um with a a tape binding you know it's the cheapest possible book production you can actually have um and i i know a little bit about book production because i've been publishing for you know, 50 years. Um, so I've seen all the various phases of it. And I know that poor old Rupert's book is the cheapest you could do with that text. And it had to be produced in England. And I think that shows Australia's lack of respect for this knowledge. The, the only book I know of about Barawarano fish traps is the same. The cover is reversed out type. Once again, saddle stitched and um, runs to 66 pages or thereabouts. The cheapest possible production you can get on what may be the oldest human construction on earth. That's what Australia thinks about Aboriginal culture. Yeah, that's some poor bookmaking as well. Um... Bruce, what advice do you have for event programmers and educators like us here at EGA who want to better connect with, engage and represent the voices of Aboriginal Australia? And I think you've touched on this a little bit, but if you have any further advice for us. I try to include a number of Aboriginal people in the program, not just one. I'm holding up a few books. Larissa Berents, uh, After Story, um, Tara June Wintz, The Yield, um, Anita Heiss's new book, um, which acknowledges the language, and um, a, a really new writer, uh, Lisa Fuller, Ghost Bird. Your teenage children would, would love this book. All of them really well worth it, but I'm probably looking at another 20 or 30 here. Um, 
but I just thought I'd give them a plug. Um, but often um, Aboriginal people are approached at the 11th hour uh, to sign a document uh, or a, something that's got to go to the government about the environment, and they're approached at the absolute 11th hour. Um, that's very frustrating. Uh, it also doesn't allow the community enough time to actually interact with that document. Um, and it's the same at conferences where, you know, there might be one token Aboriginal person at the um, invited to speak, you know, we're only 3% of the population, but I, I think there's um, such a thing as a positive preference. Um, you know, it worked really well uh, in the early days of feminism, um, and unfortunately feminism uh, still needs to operate today because um, it's still a patriarchy. Um, but all the lessons learned from feminism can also be applied to Aboriginal people. That um, There are times when you actually need to positively discriminate, and I think one of those times for Aboriginal people and women generally is now. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, I think it's really important that people uh, go out of their way to uh, try and uh, find and include uh, people at the at the beginning of the process, so, so that people are uh, Aboriginal people are, uh, aren't just yeah aren't just as you say on the on the outside or, or brought along as a sort of token extra, but are actually you know become part of that community as well and part of that uh, organisation. Uh, our next question. Wait for it to pop up. Thank you for everyone for joining as well. Um, Gardenstates.org uh, or entheogenesis.org are the uh, two websites. Uh, our webcast, of course, uh, this month's webcast with John Safran uh, going ahead on Wednesday night, which is tomorrow. Uh, our next question, how can we get native food better represented in the food economy? Um, buy from Aboriginal people. Um, thank you very much, Bruce, for uh, joining us today. Uh, how do we encourage younger, early career Indigenous people to engage with us uh, and share expertise? Um, I feel like this uh, we, we've got a few iterations on similar questions here, Bruce. <laughs> it's about trust. Um, you know, people are uh, wondering why Aboriginal people aren't uh, getting immunised as quickly as other people. Well, apart from the... Um, availability of supply. Um, the, the thing is that Aboriginal people have got really good reasons to distrust white government. 250 years of really good reasons. And, um, you know, if we can't fix deaths in custody, if we can't fix um, bilingual education for Aboriginal people, if we can't fix... Um, any of those things that were mentioned in the deaths in custody report, those all those recommendations, half of which have been acknowledged, um, then we, there is no relationship. So we have to establish the relationship before anything will change. So we can't get more involvement from Aboriginal people in non-Aboriginal organisations until the relationship changes. Yep, absolutely. That, that's often legislative. Um, it's often about making sure that our legislation uh, represents the better angels of our hearts. Yeah, man, Darklight in the comments was just uh, commenting as well that uh, uh, she remembers how, how daunting public speaking was uh, for her when uh, when she was younger. And I think, Darklight, that's uh, the experience of most of us uh, when we were younger. I don't think too many of us took to uh, public speaking with uh, with ease. Um, and those those that do, um, well, lucky them, I suppose, there's always going to be a few as well. Um, I think that might be our, our final question today. Um, there's some thanks coming in in the, uh, in the comments section. 
Uh, so thanks very much for joining us this morning, Bruce. We really appreciate you coming on uh, to speak to this uh, small, uh, intimate uh, audience uh, for Entheogenesis Australis. Uh, this is a recording that will be broadcast as part of the uh, December Microdose webcast, uh, a fill-in for our in-person events as we've had to have constant fill-ins for in-person events. Uh, but Bruce, we hope that we might be able to see you in person um, and have you in person at an event um, because it's always just that much better when we can actually uh, see uh, the people uh, that we're, we're speaking with. Um, are there any last thoughts that you want to share with Australia's uh, ethnobotanical community this morning? Well, just a, a, an extension on the answer I gave before. Um, one of the most knowledgeable people working on the farm um, has an, worked as a, in a nursery, has enormous uh, botanical knowledge, but when confronted with an audience, um, absolutely freezes. Um, so he is the knowledge holder, but he's... Um, because of his educational experience, he's not in a position to hold the fort, um, and that's a real shame. So finding the most eloquent Aboriginal person is not always finding the most knowledgeable person, and, and that would go for any society, actually. Um, so that has to be considered when engaging with um, Aboriginal knowledge holders, not all... Um, are going to be able to um, address a, an audience. You know, sometimes the best way to learn is um, two people with two shovels and um, two baskets are working together. Thank you, Bruce. Yes, very sound advice. I think some of the most uh, interesting people I know are not particularly good at public speaking and you, you need to be able to find them in that in that kind of arena, in the arena that they are most comfortable in or the, the farm or the, the, the garden, wherever it is that they're most comfortable uh, and, and speak with them there. Bruce, thank you so much for joining. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having the opportunity to have a discussion. Thank you very much for joining us on our special webcast with Bruce Pascoe. Uh, this is on the lead up to our all day webcast that's going to be happening on December the 5th. You can register for that at the Entheogenesis website, entheogenesis.org. Just have a look along the bottom here for the spelling of that, or you can find that very easily by having a look at our YouTube page, which I hope you're subscribed to. If you're not, make sure to subscribe now. Next weekend, we're going to be hearing from a, a range of experts uh, in our community uh, on ethnobotanical plants and knowledge and it's going to be a fantastic event I'm really looking forward to it I've seen some of the content that has been recorded some of it's going to be live and uh, it's really going to be a treat for you this is all of the lead up as well to next year where we're hoping and I think we will. I don't think any other catastrophes are going to happen where we can finally get everybody together once again because it is the in-person events uh, that truly make EGA. But we really hope that you've enjoyed all of the webcast events and every little bit of uh, money helps uh, to fund these not-for-profit projects. Uh, every donation helps uh, to fund things like these webcasts uh, and our resources as well, which you can find at the EGA website. Thanks for tuning in today. Make sure to register for updates from EGA, and I'll see you next weekend. Goodbye.